Good evening. Uh, welcome to our, our second in a series of presentations about bird window collisions. My name is Jerry Balls, and I'll be your host today. And after tonight's uh, presentation, we're going to have a question and answer period. And, and one of the purposes of this series of presentations is to gather information about bird window collisions and use it to formulate economically feasible recommendations of the best ways to retrofit the U.S. Bank Stadium as well as other bird killing buildings to make them bird friendly. They will be your chance to contribute to this fact gathering opportunity to ask a question that will give insight into this economically feasible solution for retrofitting the stadium and other buildings. Our speaker this evening earned her BA and PhD in in ecology and evolutionary biology at Cornell University, working with Dr. Tom Cade, who used captive breeding to restore the peregrine falcon to the eastern U.S., developed her in interest in captive propagation as a tool to save endangered species. This led her to the Wildlife Conservation Society's Bronx Zoo, where she started as a curatorial intern and in 1978 and ended as curator and chair of the ornithology department. In 2009, she moved to the American Bird Conserv Conservancy as collisions program director and has recently published the second edition of the Bird Friendly Building Design. And if anybody is interested in getting that, uh, give me a note or, or probably uh, contact uh, Christine directly and, and she'll get it to you. She has also created AIA LED continuing education classes on bird friendly design. With this, with this, I'd like to introduce Dr. Christine Shepard to address why birds collide with glass and how we can stop them. Thank you. I'm Chris Shepard. I'm from American Bird Conservancy. You were an NGO that uh, focuses on bird conservation in basically North and South America. Um, we create reserves for the rarest of the rare. So if you go see the marvelous spatula-tailed hummingbird in Peru, we helped create a reserve for the last 20 pairs. We do a lot of work in North America managing joint ventures, which are really looking at uh, forestry techniques to try to bring back species like the cerulean and, and golden wing warbler. Um, we work with partners in, in Latin America, not just to create reserves, but um, to help people uh, develop programs for shade-grown cacao and, and coffee, so uh, crops uh, that can support more birds than, than most of the agriculture. Um, and you can, well, and one of the main things we're doing right now is lobbying like crazy to save the MBTA, um, the Farm Bill, and other federal legislation that protects bird species. Um, so ABC does a lot of policy. Um, and at the bottom of the pyramid, you can see eliminate threats. Um, these are really global threats. They're obviously not restricted to North and South America. And I'm excited to say that I've been contacted by an architect from Libya who is working on collisions. Uh, Bird-friendly building design has recently been translated into Korean. Um, so people around the world are starting to really start to pay attention to, to this issue. So I do give a lot of classes uh, to architects and uh, other professionals who need continuing education credits uh, to remain certified. And I thought that potentially to distinguish myself from, from Dan Clem and Michael Majeur, that I would uh, show you the kind of class that I give to architects. I've cut it down a bit because um, it might be more than you guys want to sit through. Um, but this is sort of the one of the approaches that we've taken um, because you want to get people to understand about the problem of collisions before they start designing buildings. Once they've even published a design, it's too late. You know, they're emotionally wedded to it they've spent money on it, um, and they're really talking about a retrofit. I, you know, frequently some poor junior architect 
calls me up and says, we've just designed this building and I've been assigned to make it bird friendly. Well, all right, you're already doing it. It's gonna cost you money if you do that. So we need to try to get to policymakers, architects, and so forth, so that they understand the importance of doing this from the beginning, not later. When you do one of these classes, they always insist that you have learning objectives. And what I tell people is that when they finished listening to me, that they will never see a building the same way again. Um, they will understand the challenges that face birds, why birds are important, and we should do something about this, where to find solutions, you know, and the fact that most, if not all, solutions for bird-friendly building design overlap significantly, if not completely, with solutions for simply controlling heat and light in buildings. So you don't have to do anything different or new. You simply have to decide on using A instead of B. This is my photograph to illustrate the fact that many people believe that birds have intrinsic value. Um, I probably don't have to tell any of you that birds have cultural importance. It's interesting as you go around the world, you see similar birds representing sort of the best traits of humanity. So freedom, peace, things like that are often represented by those birds that you see there, fidelity. Birds obviously have significant economic importance. People really don't recognize how important they are. They contribute billions of dollars um, in terms of things like insect control. Um, there are woodpeckers that specialize in eating emerald ash borers. Um, you know, they'll eat the, the bugs that will give you West Nile virus. They uh, regenerate habitat. So birds are very important to the way the world works. And it's not enough to say, okay, we've still, we've still got two square miles, you know, the population's not extinct, there's still a few of these birds left because the way birds function as, as part of the universe, as part of the ecology of the world, they have to be here and there and there and there. They really, they, you know, they have to be in all the places where they have always lived doing their job. Um, and people sometimes lose sight of that. It's like, well, it's not an endangered species, so we don't have to worry about it. Not true. And for people that are only interested in the bottom line, I think 40 billion at this point is an underestimate. Um, people pay a lot of money for trendy bird watching gear like that, um, as well as you know those giant lenses that people carry around, travel, bed and breakfast, and so forth. It is uh, one of the most popular and rapidly increasing hobbies around the world, especially um, in the US. So there are reasons for everybody to want to save birds. Bird that had been rehabilitated and uh, was being released, and they released it right in front of a mirrored glass wall. Oh, wow. And the bird, people are always asking, do you have, you know, video of birds hitting glass. No, it's almost impossible to know exactly when and where that's going to happen. Um, and I certainly wouldn't want to replicate that. So numbers. Um, obviously, it's really hard to, to get a measure of even how much glass there is in the world, um, much less how many birds are hitting them, because it's everywhere. Um, some of the earliest studies of what we call anthropogenic threats, so things that people do that inadvertently kill birds um, have been done on things like cell towers and uh, wind turbines because you know where they all are. So it's actually fairly easy to, to do a study. With glass, it, it's impossible to comprehend all the glass. Um, and in the beginning, people that worked on monitoring programs, their goals really were to document the fact that there was a problem hoping that somebody would do something about it, and to save the birds that were injured, that hadn't died yet. Um, so it's only relatively recently that scientists, um, aside from Dr. Clem, who started working on this uh, problem, he and I are about the same age. So when I was doing my PhD, he was starting to work on this. Um, I started a long time after he did. Um, but anyway, people are really starting to do science um, around collisions, but it's difficult to do because um, it's, you know, every place you go is different. The same kind of glass on each side of a building is going to do different things. So, complicated. But, um, the best estimate we have now 
um, the Smithsonian collected monitoring data from every program that they could find. They collected data from museums that uh, took birds that had hit windows and died. Um, pretty much every source of information that they could come up with. And they subjected uh, these data sets to really sort of up to the minute statistical analysis, you know, stuff that's way over my head. Um, they threw out data sets where they didn't have enough information to, to, for it to be complete. Now, if you don't know how many days people went out and didn't find birds, it's really hard to figure out exactly, you know, how many birds you would estimate um, were actually hitting a building. Um, and they, they put it together and got this estimate of 300 million to a billion, uh, which is an interesting number. Back in 1990, Dan Clem did a back of the envelope calculation and came up with an estimate of 100 million to a billion. Um, and subsequently, other people have uh, refined uh, that estimate, and they, they generally have come up with estimates that are in that same ballpark. So it was interesting, you know, after applying a lot of statistics and so forth, to have that number confirmed. At this point, the odds are very good that we're talking closer to a billion than to 300,000. That number was based on data that was probably gathered in 2011 or earlier. And you can imagine the amount of glass that's been added to the environment since that time. Um, and on top of that, there has been work that has shown that uh, monitors actually pick up even a lower percentage of birds than, than we had thought. So uh, it may be that uh, birds and cats really are, are running neck and neck in terms of, of uh, how many birds they kill. Um, so this is my chance to urge you to keep your kitties indoors. It's better for them, it's better for us, and it's better for birds. So what stops collisions? Um, this is something that I've been thinking about full time since 2009 when I joined the American Bird Conservancy. Um, and the basic answer is you gotta make birds think they can't fly through something, um, which is not, not a trivial thing. But um, again, Dan back in 2009 um, showed that most birds probably won't try to fly through a vertical space defined by lines that are four inches apart or 10 centimeters. Now, if you turn those lines 90 degrees, you can see how much easier it is for a bird to try to go through that. So you need to bring those dimensions down to two inches before you get something that birds, you know, are unlikely to try to fly through. Now that, we've turned that into the two by four rule because we're talking to lots of people that are building things and everybody knows what a two by four is. At this point though, we're really moving to two by two. Um, if you do two by four, it's not gonna work for hummingbirds. And it's very likely that some of the smallest warblers and things like that will still think that they can go, go through a space like that. So two by four will reduce collisions, you know, by 50% at least. Um, if you, if you wanna get more serious, about that, um, and there's you know there are trade-offs all the time. But so, what is a bird-friendly building? That was the first question I was asking myself. What does bird-friendly mean um, when I started this? Because people talk about it all the time. It's obvious that the building on the left is not a bird-friendly building. You can't tell the real trees, you know, from the reflections. On the right is what I think architects have in their mind when I come in to do this class. <laughs> so it's like. Brutalist architect, no, no glass, you know, it's gonna be really ugly, we don't wanna do it. Luckily, by the time I leave, they generally are kinda of going, oh, I could do that, you know, this isn't so bad, we could do that. So it's largely a process of education. People, you know, don't wanna to be told what to do, and they're afraid that you're gonna make them design ugly buildings. Um, so one of the first things I try to do is reassure them that that is not the case. So this is uh, Intuit's new headquarters in Mountain View, California. If you've just finished your taxes, perhaps you use TurboTax. Um, and these guys make that. Mountain View is a jurisdiction that requires bird-friendly design. Um, this glass uh, meets the requirements for Mountain View. 
Um, and you can see that less than 10% of the glass is covered by this pattern. It really doesn't obstruct people's view very much from a distance from the outside. You really don't really see it very well at all. So if you're an architect with not much imagination and you really want to build a glass box, you can. <laughs> you can also use reflective glass, mirrored glass. In this case, this museum um, has shiny glass in front of it is a pattern that is made out of what we call frit or ceramic dots that are fused onto the glass. The pattern is between the reflection and the bird. The pattern is of dimensions that a bird will try to avoid. So you really don't have to give up use of whatever your fav favorite material is if you're gonna design bird-friendly buildings. You've got a lot more latitude than I think most people think. The majority of birds that are killed by windows are migratory songbirds, so warblers, thrushes, sparrows. It's not so important for you. It's very important for architects because most of the time when you talk about birds to architects, they think pigeons, starlings, house sparrows. They contact me to find out how to keep gulls from sitting on the roof of the building. Um, so you've, you've got to remind them that we're talking about different kinds of birds entirely. Um, we're talking about songbirds, by no means just songbirds. Almost every type of bird has at some point died hitting a window. Um, but we have peaks of songbird deaths during spring and fall migration. Why don't we see dead birds all over the landscape? Well, if you look hard enough, I mean, we found a dead bird this morning. Um, Sometimes birds are injured but can flutter away. Sometimes they bounce off and land in plantings. Um, a lot of times scavengers pick them up very quickly. Um, scavengers have actually been documented staking out good windows um, so that they can snatch up the, the dead birds before people see them. So um, because we're talking about migratory songbirds, and these birds migrate at night for a number of different reasons. People often think, okay, well, they're hitting buildings at night. But the fact is, most collisions happen during the day. Uh, now, dawn happens earlier for some of these species than for us. The bigger your eye is, um, the earlier you see dawn, which is interesting. That explains which bird sings first in the morning, which is really interesting. Um, but most of the collisions are happening after birds have flown hundreds of miles. They need to rest up, they need to feed up, and so they're basically lost in the funhouse. They've come down, they're attracted into cities, um, and they're just as apt to fly to a reflected tree as they are to fly to a real tree, which is where they're looking for insects for food. It helps a bit to understand what's going on here if you understand how differently birds see the world. And it's taken me a long time to, to figure some of this out. But one of the first things is that humans and other primates, we've got flat faces, short beaks, our eyes are close together. So we have depth perception, um, we have 3D vision. Birds, on the other hand, have eyes in the sides of their heads. And yes, I know owls don't. Um, but the majority of birds have eyes on the sides of their heads. They don't see the same thing with each eye. I mean, imagine what that must be like to experience. They don't have a lot of three-dimensional depth perception. They can see towards, you know, what's at the end of the beak? Do I want to eat that? Do I want to feed it to my chick? Do I want to make my nest out of it? Um, but their most acute vision is out to the side. So we see the world as something in front of us, something that we're kind of moving into, where birds experience the world as something they are in the middle of. They're immersed in it. What's in front of them is not necessarily the most important thing. They're looking out to the side. They're looking behind them. Um, and it's really hard to imagine what that must be like. We'll see a picture of it in a minute. Birds can see many more colors than we can. And this is not unusual. Mammals lost the ability to, to see some colors back 
when we were little squirrel-like things scurrying around in the dark. Um, and later we regained some additional color sense. But birds, fish, insects all have better color vision that we have. Many of them can see out into the ultraviolet. Um, this is something that you can't really begin to imagine. Birds can see yellow and orange and red and red plus ultraviolet. And you know, it's just, it's really complicated. Um, birds can perceive the magnetic field. They probably have two different senses that allow them to navigate in the dark by seeing the magnetic field. And um, I've got a big bibliography on this if anybody really wants to know about the nuts and bolts, but they actually start getting into quantum entanglement, um, which is interesting, but a little scary. Um, and then if you look at that thing in the bottom right, that's the one area where humans actually see better than birds do. That's called contrast sensitivity. Um, as we get older, our contrast sensitivity gets a little worse, our ability to distinguish between two things at a distance. From the same distance, we can see things more separately than birds can. And it's a problem. If you're, if you're trying to come up with a signal that will stop birds that people can't see, it's really probably not going to work. Because if you can't see it, they can't see it. Or if you've got a pattern of a bunch of dots, and to you, it sort of fuses the way old newspaper drawings used to. Um, birds aren't going to see it as something to avoid either. So um, that's, that's sort of the bad news about, about vision. But it's interesting. So my model of a bird in flight right now is a kid texting on a skateboard. And I've actually seen this three times. But this is the closest I've ever gotten to getting a photograph of it. Your attention is not necessarily where you're going. You're not expecting something to be in front of you. Um, you're focusing on your you know, device, or in the case of birds, you're looking out to the side and to the back. Um, so you need something to call your attention to the fact that there's going to be an obstacle there. If you're flying through a forest, yes, you're focusing forward. You're deciding to turn left and right. But if you think you're flying towards open sky, you're not expecting a wall of glass you know, or a reflection to be in front of you. And that's what we have to do, is we have to call birds' attention to the fact that there is an obstacle that they're flying towards. People think they can see glass, um, and you can't see glass. I don't know, anybody here take Psych 101? When I took it, they taught about this thing called the, the visual cliff. They, they put a big sheet of glass on a table, and they put babies on it, and the babies crawl along the glass until they get to the edge of the table. And then they say, well, I'm not going out there. There's nothing out there. Because they don't see glass. But you learn about it. You, you know, bump into it. Sometimes you break your nose. People are injured running into glass all the time. I mean, I run into my sister's sliding glass doors. I'm sure many of you have done the same. So the difference is that we can learn the concept of glass. Birds never learn the concept of a transparent barrier out there. Birds can learn about local glass if they don't injure themselves too much when they first encounter it. That's why zoos can have glass-fronted exhibits. Um, but birds never really understand the concept of glass. And you know, we put up a row of decals like that, and we know there's a glass wall. Birds think, oh, I'll just fly around that. If I take away the cues, that tell you that glass is there. You can't tell me if this is a picture of a tree, a reflection of a tree, or a tree seen through a clear glass window. Now, when I move a little further out, you can see there are mullions, you can see there's a crack, so you know it's one of those two glass options. But only when I show you this much can you see that it's a reflection in the building across the street from the place I take my car. Um, Birds don't understand any of those cues. They don't understand that right angles aren't natural. Um, they have no idea what a mullion is. Um, this is really something that they cannot learn. Um, and that is why glass is so dangerous to birds, because they take what they see literally. To them, each of the trees there you know, is a destination that they could fly to. That is the 
Center for Global Conservation at the Bronx Zoo. They got a uh, innovation credit um, in the lead system for making 50% of the glass bird friendly. Unfortunately, most of that was for installing light colored shades, which was the state of the art recommendation at the time the building was designed. Now you can see that you cannot see the light colored shades behind the reflection on that glass. So a reflection on the outside surface of the glass can make anything that's inside invisible, which is unfortunate if you live on the 80th floor, you know, and you want to do something to your windows. Um, but it's, you know, it's something that you actually have to keep, you can sort of see on the bottom right, you can see through the glass there. I mean, that's transparent glass. That's not even like a mirrored glass. I have friends who live in the Twin Cities. I went to high school here and uh, when somebody shattered a pane of glass in the stadium, they picked up a bunch of the pieces and sent them to me. <laughs> I won't even talk about what that means, but that's, they took that picture for me. People try to, I mean, people, birds try to fly through glass to get to something they see on the other side. So this is the Ford Foundation atrium. It's on 42nd Street in Manhattan, and there are more trees in that atrium than there are for two, three blocks in either direction outside. So if you're a bird, you've been flying, and you come down in the city, you get up in the morning, and you're flying around looking for food, that's where you're going to go if you're in that. And they do get collisions. It's a weird coincidence they were washing the windows the day I went down to take a picture of it. The same glass can look different at different times of day, or as I said earlier, the same glass on different sides of a building, different angle to the sun, different things being reflected can look very different. That that just makes the whole issue a little bit more complicated. So what, what do we know? You know, we do have some science. What does it tell us? One of Dan Clem's papers from 2009 um, analyzed data that New York City Audubon uh, took in Manhattan, um, and it showed very definitely that the more glass on a facade, the more collisions. There's a direct relationship. That, that is an Apple building, obviously. When I first started, people were talking about how ironic it was that green design required these giant expanses of glass. Um, it took me a while to discover that that's not true at all. Once you get above 40 to 50% glass on your facade, your heating and cooling costs increase um, because even though they are trying desperately to make glass as insulative as other materials, they have yet to succeed. I like, hope there's nobody here from the glass company, um, hoping that they take a while to, to do that. Um, LEED was under fire some years ago because they were certifying buildings like this LEED Platinum when in fact the buildings were not energy efficient. Um, they have since rectified that. But you don't have to have all that glass. I mean, yes, you know, you need glass to let in light, and we're not saying that you shouldn't do that. But you definitely don't have to have a building like either of those. Because of this link with migratory birds, people often think that north and south facing facades are going to be more dangerous you know, than others, which is not true, because the birds are not colliding when they're flying. They're colliding after they come down, after they're flying all over the landscape looking for food. There is a strong correlation, however, um, with the number of collisions and glass that reflects vegetation. And this makes a lot of sense if you think about it. You know, it's like, where do most car accidents happen, you know, within five miles of home, because that's where you do all your driving? Well, that, this is the zone where birds are active. You tend to find them in vegetation, low down, high up. So the danger zone is really, you know, from the ground up to sort of the top of the trees. It doesn't mean that birds aren't hitting glass higher than that. It just means that if you're trying to prioritize, glass that reflects vegetation is probably the first place to start. People are finding more and more and more ways to put glass into the environment. Um, and, you know, this is a, an issue. You don't have to have a bus shelter that is a threat to birds. Um, if you're, you know, lucky people will put advertising all over it. I, there's some very nice bus shelters in Minneapolis, and I will not start going on about my bus shelter fetish, but they're small enough that you can actually, you know, do a demonstration project on them um, without going bankrupt. And people waiting for the bus can learn about why you did what you did.
down on the bottom, you see that transparent highway noise barrier. We're starting to see that in the United States, even though everybody knows it's a really bad idea. And the company that makes most of the plexiglass um, installed as transparent noise barriers makes a version that is actually extremely safe for birds. Um, so this is a problem because, you know, I can go and talk to the highway department, the federal highway department, Depending on where your road is, it may be under federal jurisdiction, state jurisdiction, local jurisdiction. You know, if you start seeing somebody talking about putting up a noise barrier in your community, make sure that they don't put up one of these things because they're really dangerous. And there are safe versions um, of the materials that you can use. Channeling. Birds often fly along the paths of least resistance which is the same thing that people do. Unfortunately, that path often leads to a glass door, as in this case, um, or a glass wall. Um, and on this building, for example, the highest collision rate per square foot uh, was on the front door. You can see there's a very strong reflection. There's a pond behind this building. Um, and that rocky outcrop really just shoots people, you know, birds down there. But you'll see the same thing if you've got two wings of a building in a V connected, you know, by glass walkways. This is a great city to, to see something like that. Because that, that V, especially if it's planted, brings the birds in and then they start sort of going towards that connector. Um, and then they slam into it and we see that a lot. People ask about green roofs a lot, um, and green roofs have now been out there long enough that um, people have done PhD studies on them and things like that. Um, it turns out that they are good habitats for birds. They provide roosting sites. They provide food and resting places for migrants. Um, people are very proud and say, and say that you know several species um, nest on green roofs. They're usually Canada geese and gulls, um, but it's okay. Uh, but what you have to remember is that a green roof can bring birds close to glass they might not otherwise come near. So it's important you know, to make glass that's near a green roof bird friendly. Birds will come down into enclosed atria, courtyards like that. Um, in New York City, uh, the New York Times building is a tall, tall building. It's got an internal atrium and birds have come down, attracted by the trees. Uh, the problem is that when they go to leave, they don't fly back up the way they came in. They try to fly out to the side in the glass that reflects whatever attracted them in the first place. Now, in this particular situation, if you had an external insect screen, that would solve the problem. Um, so, you know, there are often things that you can do um, to, to make this work for birds as well as for people. Light is a component of this problem that we're really still picking apart. Um, every year, the 9-11 Memorial in Light projects these giant beams, and birds become trapped and start circling in them. In this case, New York City Audubon knew this was going to happen, and they made a deal before this was ever lit. And they wait up all night, um, and when a lot of birds are trapped in the beam, the lights are turned off, the birds escape, and depending on the weather and so forth, some years they turn the lights out, you know, eight or ten times. Sometimes they don't turn them out at all. But so far, nobody has ever complained. Nobody, nobody wants a memorial that kills birds. So, um, but this kind of thing was seen much more frequently years ago when they first electrified. Um, lighthouses and when the first skyscrapers were installed or the Washington Monument, the Statue of Liberty. Um, you have these structures that everybody was proud of. I mean, the Fauché Tower, I'm sure, was one of them. Um, they were lit up um, and surrounding them was pretty much a dark area. Um, and you would get birds coming in and circling. Um, and you'd get the birds would circle and then collide um, this is what happens at cell towers. With cell towers, they're colliding with those guy wires. Um, this happens at drilling rigs in the ocean. Um, it seems to be related to a bright light 
surrounded by darkness. Birds don't seem to be able to move towards darkness from what is probably a light that's blowing out whatever their senses are adapted to flying at night. Um, so, but we're not seeing that nearly as much as we used to because there is so much light pollution. You just don't see that situation where you have a much brighter light with a darker background. So here we have Houston in 1873, like 20 streets by 20 streets, and now the light pollution signature of Houston is bigger than the state of New Jersey. This doesn't mean that birds are not being negatively impacted. It's just harder to document it. Um, these, the light disrupts their magnetic senses. Um, there's some evidence that electromagnetic radiation outside the visual spectrum also can disrupt their magnetic senses. Um, and there have been two recent papers that have confirmed that birds are drawn towards light, that birds are being drawn into the built environment where they then start flying around and hitting glass and colliding. So um, where we've had lights out programs that focused on maybe the top 10 tall buildings, we've discovered that height is really not a factor as much as the amount of light emitted. And the amount of light emitted by street lights in a dark area are enough to change bird behavior. So this is something that's gonna be have to address at a wider level. Light pollution is bad, not just for birds, but for humans and for pretty much every kind of animal. Maybe in self-interest, people will start to decide to do something about this. I don't know. So my solution for this is to make your glass safe for birds, um, because I think that's easier to convince people to do that than it is to get them to turn their lights out. I don't know, if you've got kids, you'll know. Um, so this is the exception that proves the rule. This is a very agile bird, a barn swallow flipping sideways, looking like Star Wars, um, to go through a very narrow gap. So, okay, two by four doesn't really work for this guy. But you very seldom see swallows on lists of birds that hit buildings. And one of the things that we've discovered from people that have been working on birds colliding with airplanes is that it takes a certain amount of time from the point when a bird observes that something's coming towards it to the time the bird actually can physically move out of the way. Airplanes move so fast that the birds can't move out of the way in time. And this is, I mean, this is something that I've just completely made up, but I can see that if you're a swallow and you start to approach a building, maybe there's something in air currents that you know, tells you there might be an obstacle there. If you're a thrush, you're flying more like an express train and you cannot make that turn. Um, this is something that, I don't know, we might be able to pull out of data. Nobody's really looked at it. You're a bird, you're flying towards open sky. There's nothing to tell you that there's a barrier there. And if you start going around looking at solid surfaces like this, where there are no clues to tell you how far away that is, you'll see that you, you really are disoriented too. So there's, you know, you have to call birds attention to what they're flying towards. So we're, we're sort of using patterns on glass as ersatz trees or something like that. Something to tell them that, you know, you can't go through here. I mean, if, if you're all bird lovers, you know, you've seen birds can zip right into a nest hole. They can zip between branches. They zoom right into evergreen trees and things like that. They're really fearless and they dive through there. Um, so. I mean, it's bad news. They go into small spaces. It means that even a small piece of glass reflecting environment can be a threat to a bird. And here we come back to the two by four rule again. People have asked me how the relative threat of a piece of glass is estimated. When, when I first started doing this, the advice we gave to architects sort of went, increase visual noise. And they're sort of like, what? Um, you know, don't use large expanses of glass. Well, does that mean a 20-story wall of glass and a two-story wall of glass is okay? You know, don't put glass near a body of water. Well, how far is it near and how big is a body? 
Um, when we really tried to work with architects, we discovered that they like measurements, they like ratings. Glass is rated for insulation value, it's rated for breaking strength. They want glass that's rated for bird threat value. So this is something that we started trying to do when we were working on a credit in the lead system for reducing bird collisions. We wanted to come up with a carrot that would encourage people um, to incorporate bird-friendly designs, um, but also, you know, even if people aren't going to, to build it, architects are very aware of what's in the lead system, so it was a very good way to get some free advertising. Um, and uh, we took a couple of runs at it, but I had started a, a testing program back when I worked at the Bronx Zoo. I got a grant from the American Zoo Association to build this contraption based on plans uh, that were created by this guy in Austria who was trying to figure out what to do about birds being killed by highway noise barriers. So why I have a noise barrier fetish. Um, so this is called the tunnel. This is what Martin Rusler called the, the tunnel. It's what we call the tunnel. This is out at a bird banding station in Rector, Pennsylvania. They've been banding, weighing, and measuring birds for over 50 years. So frequently when you hear like, you know, climate change is causing birds to migrate north earlier, that's where that data comes from frequently. If you're a bird and you've been misnetted and banded and so forth, you may be brought out to the tunnel. Um, it's dark inside. You are placed in the tunnel. And down at the far end of it, you see two possibilities for getting out. Now, if you look in the bottom right, you'll see a close-up of the mist net that stretched across the end of the tunnel so no bird actually hurts itself. Um, beyond the net uh, are panes of glass, or what we're testing. Um, and uh, we'll start testing with either no glass or two panes of clear glass. When we do that, and if the tunnel is working, Half of the birds will fly to the left, half will fly to the right. Um, once we've shown that the apparatus is working, you can see at the top on the right, we've got a striped fruit of glass in the tunnel there. We give the birds a choice of whatever we're testing and a clear control. The more birds fly to the clear glass, which appears to be an empty space, the more we think they're avoiding whatever it is we're testing on the right. So we define a tunnel score as the percent of birds that fly to the clear glass. Um, remembering that 50-50 means there's no activity. So tunnel scores go from 50 to 100. Effectiveness goes from 0 to 100. Um, so they're not equivalent numbers, which is something that everybody has to keep in mind. Um, the reason we have to do this is to, to get any idea of the relative effectiveness of a glass product, in reality, you would have to have multiple years of data on a building, and you would then have to have had that building replace the glass, and people would have had to monitor the building again. That has never happened. We use the tunnel to give us an index of relative effectiveness, and this has allowed us to get a lead credit. We got that in 2011. It's been the basis for things like the Minnesota B3, um, for legislation in a lot of different communities. We'll have a list coming up soon. So this is just one example of some of the data we got from the tunnel. Um, we looked at glass that had eighth of an inch dots in an array covering 20% of the surface, and it wasn't very effective. 59% of the birds flew um, to the other side. When we had 40% of the glass covered with dots, more birds avoided it. But still, only 76% of the birds avoided the pattern. When we went back to 20%, but it was as eighth of an inch lines separated by half an inch, over 90% of the birds avoided the pattern. The amount of coverage of the glass is not necessarily the most important factor. It's the signal that the birds are getting from that. Um, I think that if you're looking at a dot pattern like that, it looks, could look like a cloud. Um, whereas if you're looking at stripes, and those stripes are closer together than they need to be, but this was an off-the-rack piece of glass, it resonates with the bird brain in a more effective way.
So I'm always pushing stripes. If it's going to work, birds have to be able to see it. And people are always asking if they can put something up on the inside of their windows. If you can see it from the outside, then it might work. First of all, you can see how well an insect screen works. That's the, the first window. Second window, there are black stripes on the inside and the outside of the glass. And you almost cannot see any of the stripes on the inside of the glass. But they alternate with stripes that are on the outside. Uh, when we replaced the stripes with white, you can see the white better. Well, OK, yeah, white reflects light better than black does. So you can see it better from the outside. But obviously, the outside stripes are much more effective. So when it's possible, you should always do whatever you're going to do on the outside, whether you're putting up post-it notes or you know, you're ordering glass. But if you don't have any other choice, put something up on the inside of your window. Go outside every couple of hours from dawn to dusk and see if you can see it at all. I have bedroom windows where at no time of day could you see anything that was put on the inside surface. Um, but if you walk around, you'll often look in a building and you can see what's inside the room. You can see shades, you can see blinds and, and stuff like that. So there are many places where you actually can do something on the inside surface. It's just not the perfect uh, solution. It's also important that the pattern not just be visible, but it has to be distinguishable from the background. So here, as you go from left to right, each of these pairs of lines uh, gets wider in the first picture. And in the second picture, they not only get wider, but they're actually more opaque. Um, and if you look at the lines against the blue sky, they're always more visible. If you look at them against that complicated reflection, of a tree, you have to be much punchier. And again, this goes to the desire of people to make as minuscule a pattern as possible to try to reduce collisions. You can get to a point where it's so minimal that it's not visible to the birds, that it just disappears against whatever reflection or whatever they're seeing through the glass. So this, at this point, this is actually a partial list. I need to add a few. But in jurisdictions around the country, we're seeing legislation, voluntary guidelines. Uh, people are putting bird-friendly requirements into code. That's what they're doing in DC. The Federal Bird Safe Building Act has been introduced into both houses. Uh, that's something else we're lobbying about. So this is something that is really starting to happen. When I first joined ABC, I was like, why am I in the policy department? Well, because a lot of time people won't do this if they don't have to. I've reached the point where I am very happy to try to require people to do this because I don't think it doesn't cost any more. It doesn't mean you have to have an ugly building. There really isn't a downside to this. This is a comparison of San Francisco's legislation uh, with the lead pilot credit. They both came out in uh, 2011. There are issues with San Francisco's standard, some unintended consequences, but they're the first city to do this. You can't really complain about it. They're actually in the process of, of trying to do an update. If you want to design a bird-friendly building, the most important thing is to start with this in mind. This is part of the design process from the beginning, is to think about birds. You don't have to do the same thing with each piece of glass on a building. You know, there's a lot of variety. Bird-friendly design boils down to three basic strategies. One is cover the glass up with something. So it can be a screen, it could be a grill, there are lots and lots of, and I'll show you some examples. Two, use glass that already has a bird-friendly signal embedded in it. That's easy. Three, use less glass. We saw from Dan Clem's work that the more glass you have on the facade, the more collisions you're likely to get. If you simply start, especially um, if you're interested in sustainability, if you start with the idea that um, you don't want to go above 40 to 50 percent glass on your facade because you want to make it energy efficient. That's a really good place to start, and you don't even have to talk about birds yet. So there are a lot of ways to think about this. Bird-friendly design overlaps with strategies that are used for solar control, heat control, glare, um, security. There are a lot of different parts of design that can have two functions. They can control heat and light and be bird-friendly at the same time. So here are some examples. When I first started giving this class, all of my examples were buildings that 
were bird friendly by accident. They'd been designed for some other purpose, but they included bird friendly design features. Now there are buildings starting to be constructed with birds in mind, and these are four of them. Uh, the top one is the Tracy Aviary in Salt Lake City. Uh, they actually have five lead rated buildings um, because they're a, a bird place. The top right is a dormitory renovation um, in New York State. Uh, they were going to use louvers. They asked me about will pigeons nest on them. Eventually, they decided to, to make it a bird-friendly building, and they used a fritted glass, which is hard to photograph, so you can't really tell, but there's a stripe on that. Bottom right, the S.J. Quinney School of Law, also in Salt Lake City, and there are no regulations in Salt Lake City, so I don't know why. All of that glass has either got a UV pattern, it's got a screen on it, or it's got louvers on it. Um, especially in you know hot climates, um, this is easy to do because you're always trying to shade your building so that your air conditioning costs don't go through the roof. Bottom left, that is the Science Bridge Building at Vassar College. Vassar required the architects to get the lead credit, um, and they've used a combination of sunshades, um, a custom by layer frit and also uh, Ornolex glass on the other side that you can't see. So there's lots of different ways you know, to solve this problem. Here's some examples of how you reduce the exposure of glass. You can use automatically controlled external shades. I've got two of those in my living room and they really reduce the heat in the house a lot. But what they mean is I've got a remote, I can cover the glass when I'm not there. I can open it up when I want to look out. So if you have someone who wants a solution and they refuse to put something on their glass, that's, they've made entire hotels using that strategy. Um, louvers work very well. The New York Times building has a second skin. That is a sustainability strategy that is a bit like wearing a down coat. It keeps a layer of air close to the building so that, especially in spring and fall, when there are wide swings of temperature, it damps those swings reduces energy consumption. Middle at the bottom, that's the FBI headquarters in uh, Houston. I think that it's really mostly a sunshade, but you can see how hard it would be to like eavesdrop through those windows or something like that. So there's a security thing going on too. You can make a bird-friendly stadium. This is the MetLife Stadium in New Jersey. Um, there's a ton of glass in that building, but it's all behind louvers. I actually did a class for HOK, um, and they were delighted to see that they had created something that somebody was appreciative of from the bird world. Um, here are some examples of bird-friendly glass. Only one of these was actually designed for birds. Uh, the top middle is the visitor center at the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. The top left is the Church of Christ the Light in Oakland. That glass, you can always see the pattern. There's a little bit of reflection, but it's never going to be enough to endanger a bird. It all has to do with the lighting on the inside of the building. Glass block works really well, channel glass. Uh, there's a Gary building there. That's an inside frit. Uh, New York City Audubon's monitored it, and it's not, it's not a bird killer. You can do almost any kind of building um, and still have it be bird friendly. It's much easier to find a surface one pattern on glass in Europe. This is something that they do fairly often. It's something that is starting to be available in the US. Glass companies have been reluctant to, to do it, um, but they are starting to work on it. The building in the bottom right is the School of Nursing at Columbia University, which was made with a surface one fritted glass that was imported from Europe. The others are buildings with um, screen prints and, and other patterns that are on the outside surface, and they don't have any of the problems that the glass companies that are worried about it you know, it's not hard to clean, things like that. And you can just use less glass. And there's a, a bunch of different ways to do this too. So that center, that's the US mission to the UN. You can see that, yes, there's a, a glass entrance, but above it, they don't have windows until you get fairly high up. I mean, that's pretty obviously a security issue. Top left, that's the, the emergency call center they just built in the Bronx. Um, and it's actually kind of an elegant building. It's hard to tell from here, but there aren't a lot of windows in it. Bottom middle, my favorite, the world of birds at the Bronx Zoo. If you like brutalist architecture, um, there's basically no glass except skylights, uh, which aren't uh, um, an issue. So 
lots of different ways to, to use that too. What about UV pattern glass? This is a question that comes up all the time. There are three different types of UV pattern glass on the market. The one at the top is Ornolux Mikado. Um, it, if you don't look at it from the right angle, it looks like it's perfectly transparent. Um, the center, um, that's Glass Pro. That's a glass that's made in California. Um, they give you a little light that makes the UV part fluoresce, so you can see the stripes that you can't see most of the time. Um, and the third glass is a glass called Silver Star, made in uh, Switzerland, but available in the US. They tested this by installing every other pane in a gymnasium um, with this glass and then monitoring it for a year. Um, and they got many more collisions on the plain glass than on the UV glass. However, this is not the ultimate solution. I shouldn't call it that. <laughs> If you think about it, there is no UV in the early morning when birds are very active, so it's not going to work. On a day like today, when the UV index is low, your UV glass probably isn't going to work very well. So it's my guess that if you use these types of glass in Phoenix, you're going to do a lot better than if you do it in Portland. Um, and that's important. The UV part of the visible light spectrum is also relatively narrow. So you go back to that problem of having to make the pattern show up against whatever's behind it. Um, you have to use as much contrast as possible if you're using UV materials. Now, having said that, I'm surprised that some of the UV buildings with UV materials installed are doing much better than I would have expected. And I'm guessing, if you've ever seen a sample of Ornolux, if you tilt it around from some angles, you can actually see the pattern. At that Vassar building, you can stand in front of the wall from the outside, and you can actually see the pattern sort of shimmering in front of you. So I think that at some times a day when there's not much UV around, it's possible that these birds are actually seeing like, yeah, the adhesive or whatever the stuff is that's holding the UV materials. And this is something that we need more data on. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a possibility, especially if you are building a building and somebody will not consider something that's more visible than this. Um, but it's not an ideal solution. Back at, you know, 20 years ago, we thought, oh, birds can see ultraviolet. Well, now we've discovered that there are lots of species of bird that don't see ultraviolet. And a lot of them are frequent building collision victims. So this is not what you would, advise, you know, for a nature center where you're going to have, you're trying to bring all kinds of different birds, you know, close to the glass. And just a little bit on retrofits. This should actually be called an Acopian bird saver, also a Zen wind curtain, or basically it's just hanging strings every four inches. There are some installations of this, like Google has an entire wall of this stuff. It's very effective and it's really cost effective. You can't put it someplace where, you know, people are going to be able to cut it or pull on the strings. It works very well on, you know, people's homes, and, and uh, that's a nature center on the right. Feather Friendly is a Canadian company, the convenience group. Um, you know, people say, well, we, we can't put Fred on the outside of glass. They put tons of this stuff up on buildings in Canada, and it's essentially a vinyl Fred. It goes up like a window film, and then you put the backing off and it leaves these vinyl dots or stripes or, or you know, whatever the pattern is on the building. In the bottom right, you'll see a reflection of Michael Majure, who's going to be coming and talking in June. Solix now actually has six, I think, different bird safety films that they're selling. This is different versions of the first one. You can see it's that narrow horizontal stripe again. This is up on a lot of different buildings, um, and it's been extremely effective. Kaleidoscape was the, the first solution that people really started thinking about. So some, Michael Majure identified this material and named it, dubbed it Kaleidoscape. Um, previously, it was called perforated scotch cap. It looks like you've whitewashed your windows. I mean, if you've ever been in like a shuttle bus from an airport to a parking lot, and those buses come, and it looks like they got advertising all over them, but you can still see out, that's this stuff. It comes in lots of different colors and, and other varieties. The white is the stuff I've got data on. I know it works really well. <laughs> I'm trying to get information from people who've installed other, other types of Kaleidoscape. But on the right, if you look at ABC's YouTube channel, um, that's Cape May Community College. They had 
really bad glass. I mean, it's Cape May. They were killing dozens of birds a day. At the same time, they wanted to make their building more sustainable. Somehow they got to me through a program in New Jersey where convicts raised native plants. So you never know. This was the last thing I mentioned to them because I, it's like, I, I tend to blow this off. Who's going to do that to their windows? Well, the federal government, that's the uh, federal Conservation Training Center on the left. The community college put it on every single piece of glass and it stopped the collisions problem, it reduced their heating and cooling costs, and their students started using the space on the inside of the glass because it wasn't too glary anymore. You never know. I have a boss who thinks there should be like one thing that we recommend. But what I recommend is to stop collisions, you got to make your windows bird friendly. And there's a million ways to do that, whether you're most interested in something that's cheap or quick or long lasting or beautiful. You know, there is a solution that you can actually use. Bottom left, that, that was a contest winner. Temple University had um, a contest for kids to design bird friendly window film. Um, and it was, it was produced and installed on the building and it has been working very well. And actually I think it was installed on the inside surface. I'm a big fan of tempera paint. It's non-toxic, it's really cheap. You can, like, okay, bottom right, that's one of mine. Um, you can just squiggle with a sponge. Um, actually, that's me and my indoor cat there. You can play around with stencils. Other people are very creative um, and do things that are, that are much more beautiful. But paint is definitely a solution. The stuff is uh, astounding how well it lasts on the outside of the glass, even when it rains. These are all on the outside. Yeah, outside. It does not have to be white. You can use colors. I mean... I, I was inspired to, to really like this solution because in my town, it used to be that every third grader was assigned a shop window for Halloween and they would paint pumpkins and witches and just all these neat scenes on the storefronts. And you know, you'd get to go by and, and look at them and it's like, wow, this could be bird friendly too. As long as they're willing to spend the money, the Vikings can find solutions. The problem is, it's not cheap. They should have done it back when people raised this issue the first minute that that design was posted in the newspaper. It's a really, really difficult issue, and that's one of the reasons that people are studying the building and trying to identify the most dangerous parts of it. Because one of the ways you address something that huge, where they can just blow you off and say, this is too big to, to even talk about, um, is to identify the priority sections. Um, and start working on those. I've been using this strategy like at Northwestern University. Um, once they remediated one building, which they did, there's going to be an expectation, this is what I did at the Bronx Zoo too, there's an expectation that you won't kill birds anywhere else either. Um, so it's important to, to get started. It's important to do what you can um, in the hope that this will lead to doing more in the future. Uh, because people start seeing that as a solution to the problem and then there's an expectation that you will actually try to solve the problem. So um, this is it for me. You can download Bird Friendly Building Design from the ABC website uh, sometimes because it's not easy to find, but you're welcome to ask me. Uh, it also comes in hard copy and that's it. This is the last slide required by the AIA when you do a class. Um, so thank you for your time. Let me know if you have questions.